There was just like thick, black, kind of tarry. Gross pollution. Mine waste, sludge running off the mine. It's a pollution event that's repeated through history. Right behind us is actually a water drama that's playing out. My name's Bob Crombie and I've worked in Royal National Park for many, many years. So I know this place very well and it's incredibly dear to my heart and the beauty and the wonders that one finds here. So I'm very, very concerned about the safety and preservation of this incredible place. My name's Ian Wright. I'm a water scientist and I'm standing here on the Hacking River in the centre of Royal National Park. And this river is the site of an absolutely huge biodiversity drama that the whole world is watching. It's actually an interesting irony that Australia's oldest working coal mine, that's the, the Metropolitan Mine, sits right on the doorstep of Australia's oldest national park, the Royal, which was founded in 1879. It's actually the world's second oldest national park. And what's not necessarily known about the Royal, which has famous coastline views and sees throngs of tourists coming for its beautiful cliff lines and, and beaches, but the stunning rainforest that is just a valley or two over from the coast. Creeks that hopefully should be flowing crystal clear, tumbling over waterfalls. While the national park should be protecting it, unfortunately flowing into the national park, you've got the waste products of the metropolitan mine. There are a few people who know the park as well as former park ranger Bob Crombie. So when he first raised the alarm with us about coal, littering Camp Gully Creek and all throughout the Hacking River, the Sutherland Shire Environment Centre had to take notice. I walked further up the river to the mine and I found gross pollution, mine waste, sludge running off the mine loading area and the, and the turkey's nest sediment pond. But I didn't report it to MPWS, I knew they wouldn't have given a hoot. So I reported it to the Sutherland Shire Environment Centre. We sent a few volunteers up and were horrified by what we saw and we've been monitoring the site ever since. And from then on, a whole range of uh, citizen scientists and, and volunteers have been acting and trying and managing, meeting with the Environment and Planning Association, the government and the mining companies to try and manage and control this pollution and absolutely minimise it to protect this wonderful Royal National Park. People rarely see this area. It's an area that's not often explored and yet what's happening here affects the health of the waterway all the way downstream to Audley Weir and into the Port Hacking. Here we are at Audley and it is the place where most people who come to the Royal National Park come to visit and it is surrounded by contaminants that are coming out of the Peabody mine site and have done so for at least uh, the last six or seven decades. When I came to this area in 1974, I was a ranger naturalist and it was my job to look after the nature and manage all of the ecological resources in this wonderful area. I came back in 1980 as a ranger and then senior ranger protection and that's when with the new environmental laws that came into that place we began to, to look after the river and consider its health and that's when we discovered the great impacts that the mining was, ha was having in the catchment area. There were big pollution events, cold spills, black water, all the time they were basically pretty reasonably common. I was exploring and I found something up Camp Gully Creek. I found a big split with acid leachate and a, what is this? And then the creek itself was covered in white powder. So I photographed it and I took it back and gave it to the rangers at Royal National Park headquarters. Nothing happened. I couldn't believe it, absolutely nothing. And then when I rang them up later, no, not yet, Bob. Three months later, they didn't even know what I was talking about. We knew that catching Peabody in the act would be hard, and we knew that it'd be even harder to get the EPA to take notice. The Sutherland Shire Environment Centre started doing a lot of background digging. We're finding information about historical records at the site, um, about the current owner of the mine. We were looking at the environmental protection licence that they currently operate under. 
We were looking at upstream activity, council maps. Eventually, New South Wales Green Senator Kate Fairman took notice and she started asking questions for us in Parliament. All of the questions that she asked were dismissed by the minister responsible. We needed a reputable voice to add to this campaign. And so we contacted water quality scientist, Dr Ian Wright. Water quality in this river has been of incredible community concern. You see lumps of coal, small chunks of coal, and even very small particles. So the Metropolitan Coal Mine has had a lot of trouble keeping its coal operation and all of the associated pollutants, detritus, and coal particles, it's had trouble keeping it on site and particularly in wet weather. It's quite steep through here. And we also get very intense rainfall in this part of the world. But you get this incredible blanketing of fine coal material. It's fine and it feels greasy. It's black, it kind of looks a bit like Vegemite. And the trouble is that blankets the bottom of the river. And that's where all the invertebrate life lives. This is the base of the food chain. But with this blanketing of coal material, that can blanket the ecosystem. That can blanket the leaves. The in invertebrates can have their gills clogged. And that is the big concern. Is that coal operation causing uh, impairment to the ecosystem, which affects the food supply of the platypus? In this river, platypus used to live. They used to thrive. Then they disappeared 30, 40 years ago. It's sketchy. And platypus have been trapped from another location and translocated here. And the whole world is watching. We're kind of collectively holding our breath to see if the platypus that have been translocated take to this. Can we reintroduce them? This is a really, really big thing. So right behind us is actually a water drama that's playing out. Ian Wright's reputation meant that he couldn't be dismissed. And because of him seeing the pollution himself and raising the alarm about it, it meant that the story finally broke in the media. Back in September 2022, I was travelling through the southern part of the Royal National Park and came through one of my favourite spots, which is known as Camp uh, Gully Creek. It's a really beautiful spot with awesome trees, um, lovely, a lovely little flowing creek through there. But anyway, this day when I came through, I'm looking at the water and goes, uh, isn't kind of right. And then all of a sudden realise that wow, this water is actually black. It's looking like the flat Coca-Cola flowing through the creeks. It's just jet black water. And so I stopped to take a look and then filled up my water bottles and held it up and go, whoa, that is terrible. And it was clear that there's only one place this could come from. You could see it was coal sediment. And I'm, Helensburg Mine was about a kilometre upstream. And then I began investigating a bit more closely and you could look around and see thick sludge on the banks, like you could scoop up this, this mud that was kind of like, I don't know, black congealed custard, absolutely disgusting. Immediately that evening after discovering this pollution event, I contacted the EPA and it was actually kind of difficult to get them to take notice. Luckily, I happened to be the editor of Wild Magazine. On our Facebook and social media pages, I was able to raise the alarm and that immediately got traction. When James McCormack contacted us with his damning evidence of what he saw us in September. We were able to brief him on all of the work that we had been done leading up to that point. It was utterly horrifying. With that getting traction, within a day or two, I had the ABC interested. Once the ABC got interested, other media outlets got interested. It was almost perfect timing. Finally, we had really substantial evidence to bring against this mine and Finally, the EPA really started taking notice. It was about the same time that we were briefing Sue Higginson on this issue. And so when she eventually came down and saw the pollution for herself, she was able to raise the alarm on a state level and ask a lot of questions in Parliament regarding the mine's operation. Uh, a lot more politicians were interested. And so then within four or five days, we actually had um, a lot of media interest in this, which was good. Um, 
in that it placed scrutiny on the mine. The shame of it was that had I not been editor of Wild, it would have been really tough to get that same traction. So here we are again, um, just a few months later, and um, another spill has occurred from this mine. On the 6th of August, which was a couple of weeks ago, there was about 90 millimetres of rain that fell on a Saturday afternoon. And following that heavy rainfall event, a whole bunch of um, coal finds, essentially, like coal waste material um, was spilled into Camp Gully Creek. And then that coal material has since flown down into the Hacking River, which is part of the southern end of the Royal National Park. We know from sediment cores that were taken in 1996 and dated back to 1990, uh, 1940, that we have repeated loadings of coal material being deposited in this sediment. Our plan now is to take another core and to look at the contemporary periods of contaminants being released from the Peabody mine. This is, you know, just one of a number of similar pollution events that have happened. Most notably, a similar event happened around this time last year, um, and the mine was ordered to do a big clean up, but we're just seeing the same thing happen again. In the wake of um, events in November 2022, the fines were just totaling $30,000. Now, Peabody has an annual revenue in excess of $5 billion. It's like, you or I, if we earn $80,000 a year, getting a fine of just 32 cents. The EPA have just announced that they're going to prosecute the coal mine because of repeated breaches. All of the work that we've done leading up to this point, from community campaigns to pressuring local politicians to media and advocacy efforts, finally put enough pressure on the EPA for them to act. Until the mining stops and until the mine is properly cleaned up, we're just going to see this keep happening again and again. So what's the next step here for the Hacking River and for the platypus that have been translocated here? Well, firstly, right now, it's their breeding season. So hopefully we get a nice crop of puggles and this population is re-established in the Royal National Park. At the same time, the EPA is taking the coal mine to the Land and Environment Court. I think I speak for a large number of people right across the world. I hope it works and I hope they can achieve an environmental performance that's consistent with a healthy ha hacking river and a healthy and thriving population of platypus. And I'm very, very pleased to see the environment planning authority beginning to take action against them. But it's just too little at the moment. We need more than this. But this park, it's got to last forever. It's got to be protected forever. If the mine can't control what it puts into the park, then you have to question its very right for existence.